Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Welcome to another episode of the Plant Cunning Podcast. Today on the show, we have Taylor Keene, who's going to be talking about his book, Rediscovering Turtle Island a First People's Account of the Sacred Geography of America. We're also going to talk about his Sacred Seed Project and a lot more. He's a really wonderful person. Taylor is a senior lecturer at the Hyder College of Business Administration at Creighton University. He holds a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth and two master's degrees from Harvard, where he has served as a fellow in the Harvard Project of American, on American Indian Economic Development. He is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, the founder of Sacred Seed, an organization devoted to propagating tribal seed sovereignty, and is a member of the Earthen Bison Clan in the Omaha Tribe, where he is known by the name Bison Maine. He lives in Omaha, Nebraska. So we're excited to speak with Taylor, and I think you're going to love this episode. Before we get into it, I just want to remind folks that this is the last week to get tickets at the current price for the Plant Cunning Conference, which is happening at our small farm in central New York, July 26th through 29th. If you're thinking about coming, you should you should do it. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have some amazing speakers, including Pam Montgomery, Seven Song, Rebecca Beyer, Lisa Fazio, Michael Bryan, and many others. And we have some music. Actually, my band, The Hills and the Rivers, is going to be playing the reunion show, basically. First time we've played in a couple years in public. And we have the amazing Michael Tamburo, Mike Tamburo, who is a gong master. He's going to be reverberating his gongs through our beautiful old hand hewn barn. And I, yeah, it's just going to be a great time. Hope you can make it buy tickets now so you ha- reserve your space make sure that you've got your spot and get the lowest price for the event you can get tickets at plantcunningconference.com again plantcunningconference.com okay i hope you enjoy the episode today on the plant cunning podcast we are honored to have taylor keen and taylor is a an author an educator seed keeper a member of the cherokee nation and the omaha tribe and he's just written this book, Rediscovering Turtle Island. And we're going to talk all about that, all about the seed keeping and going to some interesting places today. So, Taylor, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you both so much for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, thank you for being on the show. So you've done a lot of things in your life. You're educated in Ivy League institutions. You've taught at really prestigious colleges. You've been an entrepreneur, a member, a part of government. You've done a lot of a lot of interesting things, but also what to me is even more interesting, what I find very vital and very cool is the working with the seeds that you're doing with the the Sacred Seed Project and and working with the this this ancient sacred geography of North America, which is a fascinating subject. So how did you get interest in all of this stuff? Well there's multiple origins to this first and foremost comes from part of our cultural resurgence as indigenous peoples. And I can only speak for my ancestry on the Cherokee side and on the Omaha side, but the Omaha's are a Siouan speaking language group. And ultimately I became acquainted with one of our most powerful prophecies, the seventh generation prophecy and the story alludes to, at least in the plains and many tribes have multiple variations of this, their own truths. And it has to do with the breaking of the sacred hoop of the Suian peoples, which is oftentimes identified as the massacre at Wounded Knee, which was the culmination of the clash between indigenous cultures and the United States, in particular, the government and the military. And it had to do with a continuance of a pan-Indian religious movement known as the Ghost Dance. And it spread throughout the southwest of what is now the United States and up to the plains and all around. And it was a very charismatic 
religion had to do with, it was an offshoot of a Potawatomi dream dance society and the Messiah, as it were, the prophet, his name was Wavoka. And it had to do with indigenous peoples going into trance-like states while dancing and connecting with the world that had once been and their relatives who had been lost. So on top of what had happened between the United States coming settlers and acculturation was the massive backdrop of the devastation of smallpox. Most of your listeners, all of us are unfortunately familiar with pandemics and the impact of such things and was terrifying for many. When we look at the impact of the devastation of this most recent pandemic, compared to something like smallpox, it was a sneeze. I don't know what the total loss of life from this most recent pandemic was, but it pales in comparison to the impact of smallpox on indigenous peoples. Conservatively speaking, 50% of the population died. And in many places, like in my areas here, around what we call Nebraska today, those devastation rates were 85 to 95%. And so it's just incomprehensible to think about. The example I always use with, with communities and individuals who are trying to internalize what that was like is imagine your 100 closest family and friends and 90 of them are gone. And whatever traditions or customs you had, familial knowledge, life ways would be so tremendously impacted almost to the point of collective memory loss. And that was the backdrop for what was happening. So it wasn't just a yearning for the world before uh, European settlers. It was a return to the world that was before smallpox. Mm -hmm. And there was quite a following. Unfortunately, the United States government viewed it as an insurgency and turned into a horrible massacre of hundreds of individuals, primarily elders and women and children. And that was the breaking of the sacred hoop of the Suian peoples and many people's eyes. And there were other events, but that was certainly an iconic one. And at the time it was prophesied that indigenous peoples would suffer for six generations and Lord knows we have suffered. And then it was prophesied that with the coming markings of the seventh generation prophecy would bring about a time of cultural resurgence for indigenous peoples, reclamation of indigenous wisdom and an opportunity to share with the rest of the world. That came about, those markings had to do with the return of the white buffalo calf, which has to do with a lot of our stories around the bringing of the red road religion to indigenous peoples. Many people might be familiar with terms like sun dance and sweat lodge, and there's many offshoots to that, but it was told in our stories that white buffalo calf brought us those teachings and then promised us that she would return someday. And that is with the return of the successive birth of white albino bison calves, white buffalo calves. And the first one was born in 2001 and the fourth one was born in 2007. And it was a glorious day for indigenous peoples as we began to understand what that meant. And I had been writing an academic paper with a fellow indigenous legal scholar who also happened to be a Dakota spiritualist, which is where this story comes from. And at the time we were finishing up writing the paper. And I remember asking her a series of questions. I saw that the fourth one was born. Does this mean that this is the time of the seventh generation? And she nodded. And I said, so this means that it's a time of, of hope. And she nodded and said, yes. And then I foolishly, cause I didn't understand the true nature of the prophecy and said, are we the seventh generation? And I remember she pounded the table. She was a very serious individual and said, no, we're the sixth and you're supposed to be a teacher and you don't know all your stories. And she was right. And that, that was in 2007. And that began the journey towards waking up to seeing what are these prophecies and what does that mean for me? And a series of events, one of which was a number of youth in my tribe asking questions like, who are we and where do we come from? And I didn't have a good answer. 
And so the book came about mm -hmm. and it was my, my attempt to do what I could to gather as much wisdom and knowledge as I could and put it into practice. And that became the book of rediscovering turtle Island and the nonprofit sacred seed around the, not only gathering the seeds and planting them, but more importantly, gathering the cultural knowledge behind those ancient agricultural life ways, which extends beyond the three sisters companion methodology and goes into much more deeply into ethnobotany. And I'd be glad to share all of the, the journey that I've been around with that, but it's changed my life much for the better. Yeah, definitely. The Sacred Seed Project sounds like such an amazing project. You're doing very important work there. And a lot of people who, who may not, I mean, on, on this show, a lot of our audience know, you know, grows plants and they know what, what it takes to, to grow and to garden and to farm. But a lot of people might not know all the things that go into, into actually uh, growing, growing food, growing, growing medicine. And it's, it's like the life ways are just as important as the actual seeds. So yes, it's, it's, it's like how you, how you cultivate, how you do it is, is, is as important, but the seeds themselves are also very important. And you had some, some amazing stories in here, especially about the, the corn. Yes. Do you think you can tell us the story of that first time that you planted the sacred corn seed in, in Nebraska on the path of the Keystone XL pipeline? Oh, sure. Yeah. That's kind of cutting to the, to, to the chase there. Yeah. Uh, there's wonderful aspects of how all this came about. I, the, the original seeds that I got were from my paternal side on the Cherokee side and a small segue before I get to the mm -hmm. Keystone pathway with the Poncas, cause that's a lovely story. Yeah. I had been serving on the Cherokee National Council. You had mentioned public offices and I had served the people of the Cherokee nation. And at a, at a meeting of our natural resource committee, our head of ethnobotany had come in and had put up a picture of the seed bank at Svalbard, Norway, and which I had never seen before, and was talking about that seed bank and discussing whether or not we should be putting some of our seeds, which I didn't know what we had at that point at all. And that reminded me of a conversation I had had with one of my lifelong mentors, Dr. Deward Walker, who is the chair emeritus of anthropology at uh, CU Boulder and has been a lifelong mentor to me. And uh, a few years prior to this event with the Cherokee National Council, Deward had called me up for what I refer to as a kick in the pants phone call, which he does to me a lot. And there yes, and it's always thinking about indigenous peoples and important things. He's the one who turned me on to the topic of sacred geography. That's been a lot of his academic work over the decades. And on this occasion, he called me up and I'm imitating my dear mentor, Dewar, because this is how he talks, he called me up and he says, young man. I said, hello, Dewar, young man. What are you doing to protect your corn? Mm. And I was like, well, corn, do what, Deward? He says, your tribal corn. And of course, Deward was 10 steps ahead of me, and he had been watching with some trepidation what was happening with some of the bigger ag seed companies like right. Monsanto and Syngenta mm -hmm. and what was happening in the country of India, where they were finding these indigenous farmers and displacing their indigenous seeds with their GMO seeds and was troubled by it. And his worry was that the indigenous tribes of North America were next. And so that had planted the seed as it were. So when I was in the natural resource committee and listening to Dr. Pat Gwynn, our head of agriculture and ethnobotany at the Cherokee nation, I raised my hand meekly and said, Hey, Pat, does this have anything to do with these big seed companies and us trying to find our old seed and all of that? And he said, yes. And everyone kind of looked at us wondering what we were talking about, because this was before there was a lot of momentum around seed saving, at least in, in my neck of the tribal woods. And eventually I got all fired up and, and I was upset because I said, Pat, do you think that Monsanto and some of these bigger seed companies have some of our sacred Cherokee seeds? And he said, probably so. And I was fired up and I said, what are we going to do about it? 
And his response shocked me to some degree because it was very calm because he says, it doesn't matter who else has our seeds. And in the seed banks of the United States and the USDA and everywhere else is lots of seeds and probably lots of ours, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that we as Cherokees reclaim our agricultural life ways and plant it ourselves. Right. And you could have knocked me over with a feather because I knew right at the time that he was right yeah. and that I didn't know anything about it. So I began my journey and was one of the first people to sign up whenever we had our Cherokee Nation seed saving bank program and I got my little packet of 30 seeds and planted them. It wasn't too long after that, getting back to your question about the Poncas, mm -hmm. that the pipeline battles were beginning to come up. And uh, there was a lot of debate over the sanctity of water and land at places like Standing Rock. And here in Nebraska, we had the Keystone XL pipeline coming through. And at a certain point, I got contacted by some of the organizers. There was a very unique little community that was created called the Cowboy and Indian Alliance. Mm -hmm. And I got a phone call and said, hey, your tribal relatives to the Omaha, the Punkas, it's our sister tribe. We were just separated by probably three to 500 years and share the same language in many of the cultural life ways. And they said, they're coming up to plant their sacred red corn in the right of way of the pipeline. Do you want to be there? Well, I was super excited on multiple levels. One, I would never want to miss an opportunity to connect with tribal peoples around such things as seed and culture and a bunch of history I didn't know. But also the red corn is sacred to all the Suian Degiha tribes and probably beyond that. But within the Omaha tribe, which translates as the people who move against the current and Ponca means sacred head, perhaps to do with a deer or a deer constellation. And we're very closely related. And my clan has a responsibility for keeping the sacred red corn. And we had lost it. So I was doubly, triply, quadruply interested in being a part of that. So. Yeah, for sure. So I, of course, said yes, and they asked if I would come out and greet the Poncas when they came up from Oklahoma. And I said, well, of course I will. And I had all these questions about, you know, what we were going to do and who was coming up and where in the heck did they get their sacred red corn back? Mm -hmm. So the place where we planted was at, a, at the home of a, a lovely soul and a lovely couple, the farm of Art Tandrup up near Neely, which is in the heart of ancient Ponca country, mm -hmm. a couple hours away from Omaha, Nebraska, where I live. So I went up there, got there on time, which is early for indigenous time, and I didn't see anybody except for a couple of cowboys. And I remember walking up to uh, my dear friend, uh, Ben Gottschall. He and his father, his late father, organic cattle ranchers and bison ranchers. And, you know, these are salt of the earth, real cowboys. And I remember kind of walking around and looking around and foolishly asked Ben, who I didn't know at the time, I said, Hey, I'm, I'm looking for the Indians. Do you know where they're at? And he kind of looked me up and down and says, I, I would think that you would have a better answer to that than, than me. And I said, <laughs> let me ask around. And I figured out that they were coming and soon enough, I see on the dirt road, a big dirt trail from a dually truck mm -hmm. coming up the path. And they pulled up into Art Tandrup's farm and true indigenous style. They parked in the middle of the road and the dust cloud settled behind them and doors of the dually truck popped open and about eight grandkids popped out of the back and rolled out. And these two big, huge hulking guys step out and we greeted each other in our tribal language and never met them before. Mind you, we're all trying to save our tribal languages. So the fact that we carried on greetings and hellos and here's my name and what's yours and everything else in our tribal language, we all just cried, these big yeah. up, early guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, realized that it was something very, very special. Mm -hmm. And um, we proceeded to engage in a special time of prayer and ceremony. The two individuals, one was Amos Hinton, 
who uh, carried the title of keeper of the sacred red corn for the Poncas. And ultimately, I, I have assumed that title and mantle for the Omaha people of keeper of the sacred red corn. And the other was, his name is Mikasi, is his Indian name. It means wolf, but it also has to do with the stars. And he was the uh, pipe carrier for the Ponca Sundance, so a very sacred group. And we connected and talked and ended up performing a little prayer and a ceremony. And the thunder beans brought thunder and rain. And there was a number of non-Indigenous folks who had gathered. It was just a small gathering, but I remember when the rain came, they tug off and ran for the car as well. I was in the middle of the ceremony. And so my Ponca brothers told me, Taylor, you have to go get them. And so I went to their cars and knocked <laughs> on the window and says, you have to come back. They said, but it's raining. And I said, ah, but this is the sacred rain and you watch. It's not going to last very long and it's going to clear. And sure enough, they came out and we all sort of embraced the rain and the sun came back and we planted. Ultimately, I got the chance to ask them, where did this corn come from? And it's such mm -hmm. a powerful story. Art actually told me the rest of it. So I've been able to piece it all together, but the Poncas were forcibly removed from their homelands and displaced from the, um, their relatives, my tribe, the Omahas in the 1870s. And it was a forced diaspora. Um, down to hard scrabble, Oklahoma, and uh, many Poncas died on their trail of tears. And it was so abrupt because they had done everything the United States had asked them to do to acculturate, to live in homes, to become Christians, to become farmers. They did all those things, but still they were forcibly removed against their will. And they literally left their corn in the fields. Mm. That red corn um, would, had been gathered by some of our Lakota relatives and put into a sacred bundle and then ultimately returned. And that's what we planted. So it was such a powerful series of events and one of great hope. And we had planted seeds of resistance is what it was referred to as. And one of those memories that will forever be, be with me. And I was, it was such an honor to be able to witness that and be a part of it and help plant and help offer some of the prayers and ultimately for the sanctity of the land and water and mm -hmm. plant nations. So beautiful and powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for asking. So how did the corn do? It did fantastic. That was the rest, <laughs> rest of the story. They had promised me that they were going to share some of the corn with me and it warmed my heart because that meant that some of the sacred red corn would return to the Omaha's. Actually, I've ended up finding later on some of our original red corn and yeah. that's another cool story. But after they had left, I had called up my friend Art just to ask him, you know, how are you feeling and, you know, what are your emotions like? And I know we're all processing this big event and he was scared. Because he said that they took all of their sacred red corn from a long time ago and they said they were going to plant it at my farm. And that's what we just planted. What if it doesn't grow? Yeah, it's a big responsibility. And he had relayed to me that Mika C and Amos had assured him, don't worry about a thing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of powerful prayers from the Ponca people that were going in and it grew extremely well. I don't know how. After that yes. long, how they germinated, but it was an incredible harvest. And we got to embark upon a harvest of hope not too long after that. And the tribes got to welcome Neil Young and uh, Willie Nelson, who came out to help do a, a fundraiser. And I got to, on behalf of all the tribes, because the Omahas were the closest tribe still here, and I got to welcome those two celebrities and all the leaders of all those tribes. And we all came together. It was very, very powerful. Lots of good memories. Mm. Amazing. Yeah, that's very beautiful. So yeah, you're doing a lot of great work with the, with the seed keeping. What are some of the other varieties and that you're growing? What, what you, we talk about the three sisters, love you, there are four sisters in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. These are all things that I had to figure out along the way. When I started everything, all I had was the packet of seeds from 
Cherokee Nation seed program and very little knowledge. And I actually, you know, this, you can't do any of these things alone. And so I, I reached out to the seed community and the plant community here in Omaha and ultimately got turned on to, of all, of all places, the Jewish Farming Network in Omaha. Hmm. And I was out at Bloom Organic and got introduced to my dear friend, Betsy Goodman Samuelson, who was growing corn organically. And I went out to see her and it was a hot summer day and just realized how hard it was to do all this stuff. But she gave me a bunch of tips on how many plants need to be in a little, you know, in a corn community for it to do well and mm -hmm. watering techniques and just a bunch of tips about pest management and control and sort of developed a, a longer term relationship with, at the time they called it, I want to say back to the land, Jewish farming. Mm -hmm. And now it's just sort of Jewish farming, I think, but I've got a relationship with the Tri-Faith Gardens here in Omaha, which has to do of the intersection of Christianity and the Nation of Islam and Judaism together, and we have a joint garden together. So I still have a relationship with the Bloom family and a whole bunch of the Jewish Farmer Network that I've learned a ton from. So, so many cool things. Found all sorts of stuff along the way at a certain point. People had heard about my work and I had got, I got contacted by an individual who said he had a story to tell me. And I said, okay, what's the story? And he says, well, it's how I got these sacred beans from the Pawnee people. And I said, okay, well, what's the story? And he says, well, I'm whatever fifth generation descendant of homesteaders out in Western Nebraska. And I said, okay, cool. And he said, eventually I came across this grist stone set. That looks very tribal to me. And I said, yeah, it sounds like it. And he said, well, I, I wanted to return it. I thought it was an important part of the landscape and became very important to me. And he said, I finally did my research and found that it was probably Pawnee, he lived out near Kearney. And he said, I finally tracked him down. And I hear lots of stories like this and sometimes they're fanciful, but I knew this one was for real because of what he said happened next. And he said, yeah, I got in touch with them. And they told me on the phone, yeah, yeah, that kind of sounds like one of ours. Why don't you come down and talk about it? Well, you know, mind you, that's a eight to 10 hour drive, you know, <laughs> but that's, that's how indigenous people think, you know, it was no big deal. They tuck his word and said, why don't you come down and we'll talk about it. So it was somewhat of a hardship of on, on him to plan and get down there. But he said he went down there and sat down with the, the cultural resource division of the Pawnee nation. And I know them well, and I can hear them doing this. And mm -hmm. they took a look at the grist stone set and one of them went back into the back room and brought out nearly an identical one and said, sure enough, that sure looks like one of ours. And he said, well, I'd like to return it to you. And thus comes in the notions of sacred reciprocity and gifting of the gift economy. And that's why I also knew he was telling them the truth because that's how we do things. Mm -hmm. And they said they would accept it from him, but that he had to accept a gift from the Pawnees and they gave him some seeds. And also there was a bit of perhaps embellishment. I love stories like this. They told him no white man has ever had these seeds before. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds like indigenous <laughs> peoples. They gave him some of these beautiful painted like a horse seeds and they're beautiful, dark brown and they look like an Appaloosa or a paint and just phenomenal sort of a, mm -hmm. a bean bush. And because they had, you know, put this gravity onto the gift, he was afraid to plant them. So he had <laughs> contacted me and sent them over to me uh -huh. and made me go over and get them from him just as I, he had to go down to get them from the body. <laughs> so was, that's, that's one cool story. I found some of our Originally of the three sisters, I knew that there was an Omaha pumpkin squash out there, but I didn't, it wasn't readily available. And I looked and looked and looked and a couple of years after I got started, I finally heard that there was some out in Western Nebraska at the Nebraska Fur Trader Museum. So I went out there and literally that had been a part of the famous seed collection from Oscar Will, who had started a seed bank after trading with some of the tribes up in North Dakota. And he had written a book 
taken extensive notes that his son, George Will, had written, Corn Among the Upper Missouri River Tribes, and documented how we planted, when we planted, all these things. So part of it, things I've learned were from the oral tradition, but some of them came from the writings of Oscar Will. Mm -hmm. And they had kept some of those seeds there. And eventually at the little museum, which became the Fur Trader Museum, they grew them every year to share the seeds with other people and probably generate a little bit of revenue. And that's where I got the Omaha pumpkin squash seeds. So that was another cool story. My favorite one was how the true sacred red corn returned to the Omaha. Mm -hmm. And I had got introduced to another iconic individual seed saver from the non-indigenous world. That was Carl Barnes. I don't know if you all have ever heard of Carl Barnes. Mm -hmm. Cherokee individual lived out in the panhandle of Oklahoma, but over the course of his life, had uh, gathered upwards of a thousand varieties of indigenous seeds from all over the Americas, just a profound wow. legacy. Wow. And I had come across a, an indigenous seed keepers network known as braiding the sacred, having to do with how we braid the husks of the corn together to, to dry and to thresh them. And they had seen, I think it was a video that was put out by the public media of Nebraska public television. And the elders had challenged me to sing to the corn after I had planted it. So I would do that. And they came and somebody filmed me singing a song to them. And they saw that and tracked me down and had all these hard questions. Are you singing corn songs? I said, I'm just singing what I know. We're going to have to bring all those things back and, and ask me where I got my seeds from and everything else. And they finally vetted me and felt I was legit enough. And they invited me to the conference. Well, I just happened to be there when the legacy of Carl Barnes, he had passed away a few years back and his, in his wisdom, he had separated his seed collection into thirds. And each of those individuals was there at that meeting and they re returned those to the indigenous seed keepers of the Brady and the Sacred Alliance. And it was kind of a combination of Mohawks and Onondagas where everything is stored at. And they were able to work with their tribal nations to build secure facilities and all of that. And their whole mission is to return those seeds to the tribes that they came from and to encourage, you know, embracing their agricultural historical life ways. And within that, at one of those meetings, I inquired because I had seen in Oscar and George Will's book that there had been an Omaha rainbow flint. And I had looked and looked and looked, and there's other varieties that I'm constantly looking for, but they, sure enough, they had half an ear. And they gifted it back to me, and I planted it. It's the most incredible corn that I've ever seen, so resilient. Mm. That summer, we had uh, tremendous storms and wind. That's the purpose of the fourth sister to the Omahas, the sunflower, for she serves as a windbreak. So on the south side, sometimes all around the gardens, we'll plant them tightly spaced so it serves as a windbreak. As anyone knows, a real indigenous heirloom sunflower is like a little tree and very pithy and, resi and resilient. Mm -hmm. And that even with all of that protection, we lost so many of our corn plants that year due to the storms, mm -hmm. except for that rainbow flint. And, and we didn't lose any of them. And it's this huge, powerful put on the corn and the, the plants themselves turned red and it spun off sort of a white and purple aubergine seed and a whole bunch of red and they are just stunningly beautiful. And so that's how those seeds came back. So there's lots of other little stories. I won't bore you with all of them, but those were some of the beautiful ones. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Now that shows the importance of place and land and how like seed strains are suited to particular areas. I mean, that, that, that corn did really well in that land because it, it's, it was grown with that wind. So it's able to withstand the wind. It's, it's, it's figured out how to, how to do that. It is also brings me to this idea that you talk about in the book, when you talk about Vine Deloria Jr. Mm -hmm. And his concept of how the land and the rituals and spirituality, they're interconnected and like, you can't necessarily take ceremony away from the land that it was meant to be uh, done in, at least some ceremonies. Yes. So for those of us who don't know, who is Vine Deloria Jr.? 
Mm. And why is it important to you? And, and why is this concept important? Well, Vine was one of our paramount thought leaders and a leader in general for indigenous peoples. Vine was a member of the Suyan Confederacy and from just north of the Omaha's up here with our Suyan relatives. And he had a profound impact on the Native American thought and the advancement in Native peoples. He served as the executive director for the National Congress of American Indians in the 1970s and wrote a series of books that were impactful to so many of us. Many of them had such an impact upon me. The one that got a lot of uh, attention in its origins was Custer Died for Your Sins. And the next was God is Red. And I tried to read both of them in my 20s while I was in college and got a certain take on it. The sort of, I felt it was sort of a raw, raw celebration of perhaps an extension of the red power movement, meaning people were protesting and I didn't quite get it. I read it again in my thirties and began to sort of get things. It wasn't until my forties that everything came full circle. And I realized that what Vine was positing for indigenous peoples is that the land, mother, sacred geography is the religion of indigenous peoples. And again, that there's no separate in it and that those individuals who were protesting were protesting very important sites. And that's why he put them into his work. And it wasn't the act of resistance as an extension of the red power movement in the late 1960s, but cultural awakening back to the importance of sacred geography and all these things sort of blew my mind. He has so many concepts. One is that time and forgive my little poked my brother earlier on about white man's time. Vine spoke of that to the European mind, time is very linear and it, 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 it clicks like a clock. Whereas indigenous time has nothing to do with anything linear, but is circular and happens in epics and repeats itself. So I tried to internalize what all those things meant and it finally began to make sense to me. Perhaps it's somewhat of a fatalist perspective, but all those things, including the breaking of the sacred hoop, all those things were things that were meant to happen. And the suffering of the six generations was meant to happen because it was prophesied so that we could come to the point as a people to find and reclaim our knowledge as indigenous peoples here in the seventh generation. And he had many call to arms for indigenous peoples. One was to reclaim our history, our traditions, our bundles, our dreaming societies, all these things that just blew my mind. And he wrote them, you know, well over 50 years ago. So to finally get it at a certain point later in my life and to share it with others was my honor. And after he had passed away, I had been reading his very last work, which was published posthumously the world in which we used to live, in which he documented a lot of the sacred powers that were documented by non-indigenous peoples of medicine keepers. And I was just blown away by it. And twofold one is as I was finishing reading it, I was lamenting the fact that Vine had passed away and that there were no more books. And I mentioned this in the author's forward to the book, but a dear friend and legal scholar, Osage, uh, friend of mine, uh, Elizabeth Homer, she was listening to me lament the loss of Vine and his books. And she correctly challenged me and says, well, why don't you pick up where he left off? And I said, that's mm -hmm. ludicrous. <laughs> Vine was a legal scholar and, you know, inspired all of us of our generations. And she said, well, you got to meet him, didn't you? And I said, well, I did. Yeah. yeah I got to know Vine a little bit and very nice man. And she said, you are a professor, right? You got time to write books? And I said, yes. He said, well, you better get after it. So that was uh, the impetus to do so. And so I've done my best to internalize lots of the things in the, I can't remember if it was in the forward or the afterward to his final book, his son, Phil Deloria, who is now, now at Harvard and the only tenured Native American there. I, he Parafr I'm not paraphrasing what he said. He said, you know, we lost my father in the autumn of his life and we all wish that we could have, having, have had him longer, but 
you know, he got this workout and it's my honor to carry on. And I, uh, I didn't have to ask my father because I know what he would have said as the challenge and the call to arms for indigenous people, which he did in all of his works. And that was a very simple, but powerful, when are we going to listen to the plants and the animals again? Mm -hmm. And that has inspired me a lot. One of the chapters in the book speaks of the reclamation of the sacred feminine and a corn bundle. We're still in the process of trying to get back to the Omaha people, but I had read those prophetic words the morning that I had gone on a, a run and a prayer down by, by the river outside of Cody, Wyoming, as I was visiting the Buffalo Bill Center of the West and joining the Plains Indian Museum Advisory Board and became aware of a sacred bundle of what we know as mother corn to the Omaha people. And that was a powerful prayer because in my prayer that morning, I had listened to what Phil had said about his father's word, Vine's word. And, and I remember asking creator and spirit that may I be a strong enough vessel if the plants or the animals need me. And that was the day that I was introduced to mother corn. She's a perfect ear of white corn that is symbolic of the people and fertility for the Omaha tribe. And one of the objects, set of objects that we had lost and now she is known to us again, and we're in the process, very slow process of figuring out how to safely get her home. Mm. So lots of wonderful things along this journey. So yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And yeah. I think that you've definitely picked up the mantle of vine with this book and with your work. So I just wanted to say that I'm grateful for, for you and for your work and I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I come anywhere near feeling his shoes, but if I can try to walk in his moccasins for a little bit and to take what I learned from him and to build upon it and share it, then really? the, the hope is that someday long after I'm gone, some younger indigenous person is going to pick up this book and say, mm -hmm. oh, oh, wow, there's yeah. some neat stuff in here. And I'm going to research it myself and correct the things that Mr. Keen didn't do right and take it <laughs> even further. Yeah. That's, that's, that's all we can, that's what we can hope for. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But you definitely are taking that idea and, and running with it. Yeah. You know, you're, you're lo looking at all of these sacred sites Yeah. and seeing how, well, yeah, what, what they're, what they're doing. I mean, like. Some of the pictures in here are great. You have the serpent mound in here. Yes. You talk about Cahokia and yes, there are, there are so many mounds all throughout Turtle Island mm -hmm. and a lot of it, it. We've only relatively recently been, you know, in, in, as far as like the academic side of things goes, seeing how, how they're connected with the stars yeah. and how they're connected with the land and how it really interesting. These these are you're saying that this is the religion is the is the is the land mm -hmm. so yeah so i guess we should i would like to talk we haven't even really talked about the book so much yet but there's so much in here so i guess the first would be like what is cahokia for those of, of us who don't know and what is the importance of that that central mound there sure well that seems to be the sort of the heart of the work uh, that's what I gravitated towards when I was able to find a narrative and a story. But Cahokia was quite an event in this landscape that we now call America going back into the past. And it was the manifestation that turned into a city that was the manifestation of a trading network. That's what I refer to as the Cahokian Empire. Ultimately, it was a city, which most of the public wouldn't think of indigenous peoples having cities, but we certainly did. It was the third largest city in the world at the time. They're outside of what is present day St. Louis, right on the border of Illinois, at the intersection of the Missouri, the Mississippi, and the Ohio rivers. And there had been a community there for some time prior. Indigenous peoples had been on this land for tens of thousands of years. We can talk about that as well. But around 900, it began to change, and you saw the introduction of corn coming to that community, being 
uh, utilized in the ceremonial fashion. And somewhere around 1,000 more people started coming and corn began to be grown in more than ceremonial fashion. Although that was not all of what they were, they were eating. There's wonderful work by Dr. Gail Fritz called Feeding Cahokia. I was just out there actually and got to mm -hmm. co-lead a tour with her. And she talks about the litany of plants that were being utilized. Corn was certainly among them, but not mm -hmm. chief amongst probably what was being used for agricultural life, life ways. Lots of ethnobotanical relationships there. But the big thing that happened at Cahokia, which probably brought down a lot of change, was a supernova in 1054, common era. And there are many stories of bright stars in the sky. I think of Christianity and the birth of Jesus, but a supernova would hang there for weeks, if not months. And we can only imagine what beacon that might have been. And the individuals that were there who were already building a community, that was the impetus for many more to come. Mm -hmm. And you see the construction of the landscape there, including the Grand Plaza and the Grand Mound, which ultimately was designed with a relationship to the stars. So Vine posited to that indigenous religions are tied to the earth. I would move that forward a little bit and say it's also about our relationship between earth and sky mm -hmm. and earth and the below world. Mm -hmm. And you have this concept of the tree of life, the axis mundi, mm -hmm. and in the upper realm is the branches of the tree of life and in its roots is the lower watery realm and the middle realm is the one that we inhabit and thus you have this cosmology the story of the first humans first father first mother sometimes she's known as mother corn the woman who never dies earth mother mother earth not unlike gaia of the greco tradition and all these stories of the first humans and their trials and tribulations and relationships with the thunderbirds of the upper realm and the underwater spirits and serpent of the lower realm and all of those things were being celebrated at Cahokia. Mm -hmm. So we broadly can define civilization as the explosion where mass food and agriculture meets religion. And for North America, that is Cahokia. And somewhere around the year 1000 is when it began to explode and you had at its city center, much like downtowns anywhere. Many people don't live there. They live in the suburbs, but you have 15 to 20,000 in the city center and somewhere between 150 to 200,000 in the outlying communities and probably even further outside of people who would travel for the wow. ceremonies that were there and the story of the death and rebirth and ascension of first father was probably core to that. And that's the story that I relay in the book around Cahokia and the stories of a, a fictional character known as Honga, who uh, comes from one of these outlying communities and ultimately uh, experiences all of the life ways of the Cahokian empire and rises to become a dynastic leader. And then the ultimate uh, end of those dynasties somewhere around 13, 1300. Mm. So this is just massive. It was a huge place and tons of people. Lots of, lots of people. Yeah. And again, it was the third largest city in the world at the, at the time. And the trading network extended well beyond that up to the Great Lakes down south, the trade of obsidian, precious stones from the southwest, mm. perhaps birds and feathers, east coast marine shells, and of course, things to do with the plant and animal nations. But yeah. it was uh, certainly a trading empire and many uh, aspects of that went on to affect tribal cultures after its dissolution somewhere around 1350. Yeah, there's a, a really interesting picture in here you have too when you get later in the book where you talk about how there's this big hole in, in there for a, in, in the mound. Yes. A pole to go up. And then the after, grand mound. Yes. Yeah. And it three days after it, the, the pole was put in there, lightning struck it. Yes. So was yeah. that, do you think that was part of like the, the 
technology of the of the mound was this the, the lightning mm. that's a, a very good question technology perhaps that is hopefully for the future for me to explore i know that the engineering of the mound is profound as well just the fact that it has stayed for so long I would like to explore this further from the anthropological record because at this point, hopefully no one's going to tear into it anymore. But yeah. I know that there is a combination of sand and clay in there because somehow it drains and doesn't break down, even though it had been damaged considerably in its early days as Americans discovered it and didn't know what to do with it. And so they've had to rebuild it, but there's so much within there and ultimately what I allude to in the story of Honga and what he witnesses is a tremendous event where the center pole, which is a massive part of a lot of tribal societies, especially in the Suian peoples in the plains, but it representative of the Axis Mundi. It makes that spot the center of the universe for all those that attend and symbolic of the great tree of life. And back in the day, there was a massive southern tree that was put in there and extended to the heavens. And my supposition is that whenever struck by lightning, that became the conduit between the upper realm or heaven and our world. So it would become a very sacred event. And you see this notion of where the lightning strikes as being something very sacred for indigenous peoples across the tribal landscape. And so the people would come to witness and perhaps on a stormy June day, like we're in now, and if those, that massive pole was put in place, the one that you're referring to is the story I heard about anthropologists when they discovered with LIDAR and ground penetrating radar, the evidence of these previous holes and the massive one that was at the center pole there, and they had put a sort of placeholder within there, I assume is like a telephone pole, which had been much smaller than the massive tree that had been put in there a thousand years ago. And that was the one that was struck by lightning repeatedly and they had to take it out <laughs> for their safety. But uh -huh. back in the day, that would have been a part of quite the theatrical religious show and illustrate to the people that that was indeed the axis mundi, the center of the universe where the powers of the upper realm and the thunderbirds and lightning come from their eyes, striking the land. So very theatrical and dramatic, but I really believe that's what was happening there. And that's what drew so many people to come and witness those things. Mm -hmm. Shame. Yeah. And the, the other thing about uh, the connection between the upper realms, the middle realms and the lower realms and the the relationship to the stars, I think, is very crucial. And that's something I'm always interested in is is the relationship with the stars. And not only are these sites lined up with the stars, mm -hmm. for instance, the stars and the sun and the moon mm -hmm. and, and, and lunations and the, sol the rising of the, sol the solstice and so on. But as you alluded to earlier, the myth mythologically, there's a very deep connection with the stars and the people. Yes. Yeah. What you know, what is the importance of the stars and in the relationship with the stars in both of those realms? I once I get on a roll and you have you all have me on a roll, I'm known to express a lot of platitudes, one of which is stories are everything mm -hmm. and the stars are everything. And our relationship between earth and sky, I think, extends our religion of the worship of Mother Earth to our relationship to our ancestors. So for indigenous, for many indigenous peoples and not all of them, but many of the tribes have this story that we know as the earth diver myth. And that's where the name Turtle Island comes from. Incidentally, it actually comes from Siberia and is much older than North America. Oh, interesting. And, but that has to do with our original home, which we believe is the Seven Sisters constellation, again, in the Greco tradition, that's known as Pleiades. Mm -hmm. And we traverse through the dark rift of the Milky Way from there to here. And the original journey by those original four souls is known as the Earth Diver myth. Mm -hmm. And depending on the tribe, 
the one constant is the one animal turtle. And one of the animals has the courage and the strength to dive down into the depths of this watery planet that we found when our souls first came here and transformed in animals. And depending on the tribe, it's a different animal. Sometimes it's a, a type of a crawdad. Sometimes it is an otter. Sometimes it's a bird. It just depends upon the tribe, but ultimately that clay primordial earth is brought up and turtle sacrifices itself and puts the earth on its back. And that's where the land is born out of. So we literally come from the stars and our relationship to them. You had mentioned some of the archaeo astronomy, and I was very blessed on this journey to uh, get the support and friendship of, of Dr. William Romain, who is the leading archaeo astronomer. My book is filled with more citations from him than anyone else. And Bill, in his infinite kindness and generosity, tucked me under his wing and helped me vet the book. I would say in sort of a academic peer review perspective, that was brutal. Okay. <laughs> lots of rewrites, lots of fixing things, but lots of lessons. And he's become a dear friend of mine. And I actually hope to see him here in a couple of days. I'm heading out to the Ohio River Valley and I'm going to be going to an event out there and hope to spend some, some time with him. But many of the illustrations and teachings you see in the book come from Bill's, Bill's work and so complicated to summarize the relationship to the stars does many things, you know, it helps us in agriculture. You mentioned when to plant and why it goes beyond that. I believe that we have our own indigenous astrology and that those are evidenced in our star lodge stories. We have our own constellations that are similar to what European societies have, and they are our own. And ultimately it has to do with that journey of the souls. And so you see a lot of the alignments, not only to the, the sun and the moon and the solstices and the equinoxes, but to also rising of important stars in our realm. And it just becomes more and more complex. And hopefully readers of the book, listeners today can look at my book and be a little overwhelmed by some of the information, but understand that it was so complex and so powerful. People often ask me, you know, what is the one thing that just blew you away? And I said, well, that's pretty easy. That had to do with what I learned from Bill and it's constantly being revised and changes as they find more, but it has to do with the Newark works complex in Ohio and the Newark works encompass the great circle in octagon and the great Hopewell road. And that is one of the pinnacles of the book is what I refer to as the ceremony of ceremonies. And that has to do with what Bill was able to reconstruct from an archeo astronomical perspective of things that were happening and being documented there. But ultimately it's on about a 20 year cycle that at this site, I believe it was the ceremonial initiation teaching school and that you would go and witness all these sacred events in nature over the course of a year culminating on sunrise and sunset on the summer solstice and initiates or adepts would carry the bones of the deceased from their families and tribes and at sunset they would embark on the great Hopewell Road which every 18.6 years would align to the rising of the dark rift of the Milky Way on the horizon a little after sunset. And as you would walk on the Great Hopewell Road towards this natural sugarloaf mountain, you would see the dark rift of the Milky Way rising up so towards you mm. and therefore give those of us in this temporal plane of the middle world the opportunity to take the bones of our deceased and to offer them to the journey of the souls to the dark rift of the Milky Way. And it would culminate with the uh, serpent constellation biting at the sun at sunrise. And these sorts of things would have been the most dramatic, wonderful show that I could ever envision. And someday I hope to be able to experience that and to show others and document it. What it looks like now is probably very urban. Probably a lot of parking lots and buildings, but it's all still there. 
Mm -hmm. and uh, technology, et cetera. Hopefully that's one of the things I can do with this work is to be able to show that with CGI or something like that, what it would have been like for individuals to experience that wonderful celestial activity. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Yeah, and the, the serpent swallowing the sun mm -hmm. is another, in you know, important image because right pretty close to that on the Ohio River or close to the Ohio River is the the, the serpent mound, which is a very famous yes. mound, and that's exactly what what's happening is the serpent mm -hmm. is swallowing the sun. Yes, and, and you, you do do you think that 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 is the same as the as the as the constellation of Scorpius? swallowing the sun, or do you think it has other meanings to it? That's an excellent question. I, I think there's definitely a, a correlation. Is that the only meaning of it? Uh, probably not. Um, this gets into uh, things that really excite me. Mm. Um, one of the suppositions and hypotheses that I've got with all this is that um, when examining all things esoteric, in whatever culture. And these are the things that bind us together as human beings and cultures from all around the world, because there's so many similarities Yeah, it's true. between what was happening in America, what was happening in Northern Europe, these other megalithic sites, et cetera. I believe that there was some, some type of principia theologia, that there was a principal ideology of religion, some teaching that is inherent with this all that has to do with teachings of the serpent. And we have all these things, the serpent biting its tail throughout every culture. You have intertwined serpents in the rod of Hermes and things associated with, with medicine and healing and transformation into Eastern mysticism. And somewhere within all of that is the truth that will set us free. And that's part of my lifelong pursuit is to understand all those inner correlations and meanings. And who knows, I certainly keep an open mind to all these things. One of the aspects that I got super excited about was looking into some of our tribal stories about that we come from an island in the East. Yeah. Many of your listeners would say, is that Atlantis? And I would answer it. I think that that might be something that we all were influenced by. Mm -hmm. And out of that exodus, our Cherokee stories say that we come from an island in the east and it was surrounded by salt water and large turtles and there was volcanoes on it. And eventually the water overcame it. So whether that was a tsunami or an ancient apocalypse, I'm reminded of Graham Hancock's work, Ancient Apocalypse, that something happen cataclysmically to lots of different societies and a flood narrative, which we all have, and indigenous peoples have those narratives too. Mm -hmm. It's not confined to Christianity. It goes back to the Sumerian epics, yeah. but perhaps that was a common cataclysm that affected all of us, but that knowledge was diffused into other parts of the world. And maybe that's why there's so many connections. Yeah. I don't have the answers, but I love to think about it and to think yeah. of the possibilities because I know we're all connected. Mm -hmm. I know we're all related. Yeah. I, the One of the theories that I, that makes sense to me lately about Atlantis is, well, first of all, you know, 12,000 years ago, there was a lot more land above water, right? And most of that was on what is now underneath water, under the sea, the sea coast. So, and humans have always lived, most humans have lived on the edge of the sea and the, the land. You know, most of the cities nowadays, the biggest cities are all close to the sea. So it would make sense that those are underwater now. But but Turtle Island, there's like about 100 miles of shallow land under the water extending to the east, up, you know, on the full east coast. Mm -hmm. So 12,000 years ago, that was probably all above water. Mm. And there's there's... That's probably where most people were living at the time, too. <laughs> so I wonder if somewhere around there is where Atlantis was. But, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know at this point. Yeah. I love all of that. Certainly, I know, and I touch upon this in the book, but when you start looking into the antiquity of indigenous sites, one of the oldest mounds 
is known as the LSU Mound, not, not far from the complex known as Watson's Break and Poverty Point, and those go back several thousand years, but the oldest points of civilization we find are in the Florida Shell Mounds as well, and that would allude to what you're referring to. And yeah. perhaps it was, Atlantis was a series and complex geography of islands that were, you know, now islands exposed as a larger landmass before. We don't, we don't know, but it's certainly worth investigating as the type of things that I'm hoping to investigate further in the future. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, this has been a great discussion with you. I'm very glad that we were able to have you on the show and I'm excited for your research in the future as well too. This has been, this is a great book. I urge our listeners to get it if they're interested in these sorts of things. Yeah. Do you have any, any other words for the listeners where they can get in touch with you or what you have going on, what you'd like to share? A book will be released on June 11th. You can find it Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can go to your local favorite bookstore and ask them to get it for you. Mm -hmm. And you can contact me on www.rediscoveringturtleisland.com. I've got a Facebook page and Instagram page for the book under the same name. You can also follow me on Instagram on at Taylor Keen seven, and I'm not hard to find. So your listeners can track me down and ask questions further and would love to come to your local bookstore and do book signings and a talk. Awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Taylor. This has been wonderful. I feel like I could have gone on for a few more hours talking with you. So maybe we can have you again on, on the show sometime, but I would be honored. Thank you so much. And thank you for yeah your time today and for writing this book. I'm just blown away. So I appreciate you so much. AC Isaac, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.